All right, you guys, this episode of Paradigm Profiles is called High Desert Drama. Those of you who have been to a level four mainline know what it's like to be out there on one of these yards. There's something about being out there that grabs your attention, something that you can feel in the air, and something that tells you that you're not in a good place. Some people have said that this is a mixture of all the animosity and hostility that bleeds out of all those who are doing life on those yards and all those who know that they will never see freedom again. Others have said that this feeling of uneasiness and immorality are the souls of all those who have died and lost their lives in this forbidden environment. The souls of all those who have been stabbed, shot, and callously rubbed out of this life as they knew it. Mostly of all, level four yards get under your skin the same way. As soon as you step out on that yard, you feel something that ain't right. Something diabolical that instantly tells you that this is an unsafe place. High desert definitely comes to mind when considering some of the more violent level 4 prisons out there. Over the last 10 to 15 years, high desert has had its share of stabbings, shootings, killings, riots, and mayhem. This can't be refuted. How many times have you seen the mainstream media put articles out about another inmate killed in high desert? Or two inmates stab another inmate to death? This profile will highlight just some of the recent killings that have taken place in high desert and the history of high desert since it was opened back in 1995. I remember as far back as 1990, 1991, when I was in Susanville and seeing construction crews just start to break ground for High Desert. You could see the heavy machinery and all the construction equipment through the fences out on the yard. At that time, I obviously had no idea what High Desert was gonna be like or what type of history lied ahead. But I remember asking what those construction crews were doing and that's the first time I heard about them building a new prison or a new level four called High Desert State Prison. After an almost four year stay, I paroled from Susanville, or Susie's house, in June of 1992. Three years later, High Desert State Prison officially opened up for business and housed a total of 2,324 inmates, the institution's full design capacity. As of April 30th, 2020, High Desert was incarcerating people at 141.4% of its design capacity with 3,286 occupants. Like all other California state prisons, High Desert has always been extremely overcrowded and had to devise its own housing strategy to accommodate all the extra bodies. The gyms on the yard were converted into makeshift dorms, huge overflow areas where inmates were packed in like sardines and triple stacked on bunk beds. This kind of overcrowding that became commonplace for all California prisons increased tension, created hostile environments, and allowed an abundance of misclassified inmates to congregate on lower or higher level yards. Sometimes inmates can get classification overrides by the institution's classification committees, meaning they can be allowed to remain on a lower or higher level yard based on certain criteria that the institution may deem them eligible. But with so many extra inmates to contend with, the classification committee has become nothing more than a turnstile serving no other purpose than to herd the inmates through the aimless process. For the community of Lassen County, however, the expansion and building of High Desert became a godsend. Over half of the adults in that community were employed at the prison and the prison in essence became the source of much needed jobs. However, it didn't take long for High Desert to begin experiencing its share of trouble. In 2015, 20 years after the prison opened, the State Office of the Inspector General began and completed a six-month investigation into conditions of the prison after complaints of officer misconduct and prisoner abuse. The investigation and the subsequent oversight called for changes at the facility. Although there are buildings to house certain inmates in protective custody, such as sex offenders, officers put other inmates near them. The prison 
has had a rapid turnover in top management for nearly a decade, with seven wardens in eight years. In their report, investigators wrote, there was a perception of insularity and indifference to inmates at High Desert, exacerbated by its remoteness and a labor organization that opposes oversight to the point of actively discouraging members from coming forward with information that could adversely affect other officers. This is reminiscent of the Green Wall all over again. They have created a culture that discourages officers from coming forward and reporting misconduct when they see it. In these situations, officers who do break the code of silence are ostracized and are targeted by other officers who are on board with the code of silence. This not only has a trickle down effect, but it also has a trickle up effect where ranking officers are also encouraged to partake in this ominous and sinister conduct. You're either part of the solution or you become part of the problem. And here's something else to keep in mind. Whenever you have an unscrupulous and nefarious administration that establishes itself within a prison environment, this also spreads and permeates amongst the inmates. It spreads like a rampant cancer. This is what has taken place in High Desert. This prison has become infected with the ills of an untrustworthy administration and this has in some ways set the tone for the inmates. It's become another Corcoran or Salinas Valley, and this is because the institution has created a hostile gladiator type of environment. It's not a secret that High Desert has become one of the most violent level four prisons within the state of California. Over the last 10 to 15 years, the numbers of inmate casualties have quadrupled since this prison first opened. These are just a small fraction of the homicides that have been documented to date. On August 16, 2016, an inmate by the name of Jonathan Velarde was shot and killed after being hit by a warning shot. This incident occurred after a riot erupted and a gun tower apparently fired several warning shots to stop the riot. This is an unfortunate situation. This guy was probably just an unintentional casualty, but when a riot kicks off, they just fire randomly into the crowd. On September 1st, 2015, correctional officers say they witnessed an inmate by the name of Matt Jagger being assaulted and stabbed by two other inmates. According to some of the prison's incident reports, officers quickly intervened using chemical agents to stop the fight and to separate the attackers. Jagger was then rushed to an outside hospital, but despite doctors performing life-saving measures, Jagger later died and succumbed to his injuries. Jagger was serving the 13-year sentence for vehicle theft and carjacking. For reasons that were unclear, the two inmates that were accused of killing Jagger were never charged, prosecuted, or identified. On February 1, 2016, inmate Andrew Thurgood, convicted out of Clark County for possession of a stolen vehicle, was found in the day room where he had been stabbed numerous times. Medical staff moved him to the infirmary and attempted to perform life-saving measures. However, he would later end up succumbing to his injuries. On April 17, 2016, an inmate by the name of Ralph Goodman was being escorted across one of the general population mainline yards when two inmates rushed across the yard and stabbed him. Goodman was being escorted by a single officer who made a futile attempt at stopping the assault. The two inmates, Jeremy Knuckles and Justin Muncy, charged Goodman, knocked him down, and continued to stab him on the ground. Responding officers deployed chemical agents in an attempt to stop the assault, but this had little or no effect. By the time officers were finally able to physically subdue and restrain Knuckles and Muncy, Goodman had already suffered several fatal stab wounds. Medical staff attempted to perform life-saving measures until life flight arrived. But despite their efforts, Goodman died at 3.13 p.m. Goodman was serving two life sentences for first-degree murder and other charges. Muncie and Knuckles were both serving sentences related to robbery convictions. On October 15, 2016, an inmate by the name of Douglas Maynard was stabbed and killed by a fellow inmate named Robert Stockton. Correctional officers say they witnessed Stockton attacking Maynard on one of the prison's exercise yards and hitting them in a way that was described as with stabbing motions. As with the other stabbings that have taken place in High Desert, 
Medical staff attempted to perform life-saving measures on Maynard, but he died a short time later, despite their efforts. Maynard was serving a life sentence out of Clark County. According to several reports, Maynard was initially serving time for a first-degree burglary. However, while in prison, he was convicted of assault by a prisoner with a deadly weapon, along with several other charges. Inmate Stockton was serving a life sentence for first-degree murder and use of a firearm. Responding officers located an inmate manufactured weapon in the vicinity of where Maynard was seen being stabbed. In May of 2018, an inmate by the name of Rodney DeLong was forced to move into a cell with the same Robert Stockton mentioned in the incident above. This is the same Stockton that was just mentioned in the previous incident who allegedly killed inmate Douglas Maynard. The administration did this to consolidate their inmate to cell ratio and to basically make room for other cell moves. DeLong, a small guy in, who for all intents and purposes was considered to be non-violent and green to the prison lifestyle, didn't want to be housed with Stockton and was described as being terrified of entering the cell. But under the circumstances, he didn't have a choice and was told he had to comply with the order. Stockton had an extensive history of violence. He was a known documented Aryan Brotherhood associate and sympathizer. In fact, he had already stabbed another inmate to death at the direction of or for the purpose of assisting the AB and to also increase his chances of gaining membership himself. A half hour after he was placed in the cell, DeLong was dead, lying in a pool of his own blood on the floor of the cell. Stockton, according to court records, dropped the murder weapon, a shank crafted from a metal cell door, through the food tray port, and surrendered to correctional officers. At the time he was killed, DeLong only had seven months left on his sentence for a burglary charge. Stockton, meanwhile, was serving life, having been convicted of murdering Corning resident Todd Bates in 1995. Now, a wrongful death suit filed by DeLong's mother, alleges that prison officials either missed or ignored a crucial warning sign that DeLong had been listed as an enemy of the Aryan Brotherhood, meaning that Stockton or any other member or associate of the gang would be expected to take flight on DeLong on site or face retribution themselves. The Aryan Brotherhood is known and has a fierce reputation for carrying out particularly brutal stabbings, including beheading or disemboweling victims and using torturous levels of violence to dissuade others from crossing the gang. Stockton was charged with two counts of murder in July of 2018, according to Lassen County court records. Last November, he accepted a plea deal on an involuntary manslaughter count, along with an additional three years in prison. Stockton's name comes up frequently in a massive racketeering case filed by the Eastern California District's U.S. Attorney several years ago which targets the Aryan Brotherhood's leadership. The complaint, filed in June, alleges that in 2016, Stockton murdered another inmate, Douglas Maynard, on the orders of Aryan Brotherhood member Jason J. Corbett, because Maynard owed a drug debt to the gang. On November 27, 2019, at approximately 2.54 p.m., correctional officers say they witnessed inmates Douglas Leon and Roger Vasquez attack Edgardo Herrera, on one of the general population exercise yards. Herrera was stabbed multiple times on the D facility mainline yard and later died after being transported to an outside hospital. Officers claimed that they responded immediately after the stabbing began and that they attempted to quell the assault by using verbal commands. However, when Vasquez and Leon ignored commands to get down on the ground, chemical agents were then used to break up the incident. Responding staff summoned an ambulance due to the severity of Herrera's injuries, but he later died at an outside hospital, despite valiant efforts made by the doctors. Herrera was serving a 30-year sentence out of Los Angeles County for second-degree robbery as a second striker, with enhancements for a street gang act and commission of a violent felony, use of a firearm, as well as having a prior violent felony conviction for a serious offense. In 2016, Herrera also was sentenced to an additional four years in Kern County after getting caught with a controlled substance in prison as a second striker.
Something tells me that this guy might have been targeted over a drug debt that he couldn't pay back. Vasquez was sentenced to 12 years out of Los Angeles County for second-degree robbery with a 10-year enhancement for the use of a firearm. Leon was sentenced to life in prison out of Los Angeles County with the possibility of parole for second-degree murder with intentional discharge of a firearm causing great bodily injury, death, and attempting to threaten or extort money or property with the use of a firearm with an enhancement for the Street Gang Act in commission of a serious felony. Are you guys starting to see a common thread here? These prison murders are becoming more prevalent because of all these validated gang members and leaders that were just released from the shoes. They're bringing the old school back as killing was commonplace back in those days. It was part of the game. You're seeing less and less of what is described as removals, where someone gets poked or sliced and then taken out of the unit. The victims that were being assaulted were being allowed to walk out under their own volition. That's changing now. It's not about removals anymore. It's about taking their win, and they're no longer being allowed to walk out on their own. Now, they're being taken out in boxes, and this is what made prison such a fierce environment back in those days. On January 7, 2020, inmates Luis Ortega and Vincent Martinez allegedly attacked Richard Leva on the institution's exercise yard, identified as C facility. Ortega and Martinez apparently ignored officers' commands to stop their attack. As a result, officers then used pepper spray and two pepper spray blast grenades to end the attack and restrain the two. Leva suffered multiple stab wounds and was airlifted to a local hospital. He was pronounced dead at 11.06 a.m. Ortega was convicted out of Stanislaus County in March of 2018 with a life with parole sentence for second degree murder. Martinez was convicted out of Kings County in September of 2014 to serve a sentence of 22 years and four months for attempted second degree murder, among other crimes. Leva was convicted out of Monterey County in September 2011 to serve a 14 year term for assault with a firearm. He was also convicted in Lassen County in 2019 and given an eight year sentence for an assault that occurred while he was in prison. On January 27, 2020, staff witnessed inmates Jose Castillo and Victor Zapian attack Richard Prieto on one of the prison's exercise yards. According to prison reports that documented the incident, both Castillo and Zapian stabbed Prieto several times with inmate manufactured weapons before the assault was broken up by responding staff. When the assault was first initiated, staff attempted to use verbal commands to quell the incident. However, Castillo and Zapian refused to comply. One of the gun towers then fired a warning shot, while other correctional officers employed chemical agents that successfully stopped the assault. Prieto was then rushed to the prison's infirmary so that they could perform life-saving measures. However, Prieto died despite their efforts and succumbed to his injuries at 3.02 p.m. Officers who arrived at the scene of the stabbing recovered two metal inmate manufactured stabbing instruments that they believed were used in the assault. Prieto was serving a 22-year sentence out of San Joaquin County for attempted second-degree murder. Castillo was sentenced to six years out of Sonoma County for assault with a deadly weapon on a first responder and Zapian was sentenced to life out of Stanislaus County for murder. Damn, old boy must have taken off on either a medic or fire personnel because I believe they're the ones who are called first responders. On May 1, 2020, an inmate by the name of Michael Ramadamovic was stabbed and killed by two fellow inmates who used inmate manufactured weapons to repeatedly stab him. According to staff who witnessed the stabbing, Inmates Rodney Rice and Robert Smith were the two inmates who killed Ramadamovic. The stabbing occurred on the C facility general population mainline exercise yard. Officers immediately deployed chemical agents and fired a warning shot from a Mini-14 rifle to stop the assault. Ramadanovic suffered several puncture wounds and fatal stab wounds to his chest, back, head, and neck. He was immediately taken to the prison's medical facility where life-saving measures were taken. A doctor pronounced Ramadanovic deceased at 11.11 a.m. 
Responding officers recovered two inmate manufactured weapons that they believe were used in the murder. Ramadanovic was sentenced to LWAP after being convicted of first degree murder out of Merced County. He also received an additional six year sentence for an in-house stabbing on another inmate. Rice was serving three years for evading and attempting to evade a peace officer while driving recklessly and corporal injury out of Riverside County. Smith was serving two years for also evading a peace officer while driving recklessly out of Tuolumne County. On August 24, 2020, an inmate by the name of Juan Boizo was attacked and stabbed to death in a day room by two fellow inmates. Correctional officers deployed three exact impact rounds to stop the assault. The two inmates identified as the attackers were Joseph Gama and Joseph Sua. Boizel suffered numerous puncture wounds to the back of his head, his neck, and his chest. Medical staff transported Boizo to an outside hospital by ambulance for medical treatment. However, he succumbed to his injuries at 9.48 p.m. Boizel was serving 12 years at a Monterey County for second-degree robbery and a street gang act in commission of a violent felony. Gama was serving 15 years at a Stanislaus County after being convicted for an assault with a firearm inflicting great bodily injury and a street gang act in commission of a felony. Sewell was serving seven years at a Merced County for possession of a controlled substance in a jail or prison on a second strike conviction. On February 1st, 2021, staff members allegedly seen inmate Ricardo Palmerin punch inmate Christian Lepi, aka Kush, in the face, knocking him to the ground. According to staff, Palmerin then continued to assault Kush. However, his punching motions at some point turned into stabbing motions. Another inmate by the name of David Morales also joined in on the assault, striking Kush in what was also described as stabbing motions. The gun tower, which is also called the control booth, fired two rounds from a standard 37mm block gun, aka the knee knocker, successfully putting an end to the assault. Staff later found two inmate manufactured weapons located close in the vicinity of where the stabbing occurred. Kush was serving nine years out of Tulare County for assault with a deadly weapon. Palmerin was serving a 20 year sentence out of Kings County for second degree murder and Morales was serving 24 years out of San Francisco County for assault with a semi-automatic firearm and evading police. On March 14, 2021, an inmate by the name of Isaiah Sharp was less than a month away from paroling when he was stabbed and killed by his cellmate, Andrew Hilford. Sharp was stabbed a total of 96 times with a plastic inmate manufactured stabbing instrument. Sharp's family is apparently filing a wrongful death lawsuit after they learned about the circumstances and details of the crime. According to the lawsuit filed by Sharp's family, they learned that several months before attacking Sharp, Hilford told one of the floor officers that he wanted a specific roommate, his homeboy, moved into the cell with him, and that he would hurt anyone else that they stuck in the cell with them. Sharp's grandparents, Nicholas and Lauren Snyder, claimed in the lawsuit that the Nevada Department of Corrections violated Sharp's rights when the prison carelessly, recklessly, and unjustifiably housed him in a cell with a known violent inmate who had previously threatened harm against anyone placed in his cell. At about 6.30 p.m. on March 14, 2021, trainee correctional officer Lewis Hatton was walking through a cell block when Hilford shouted at him from the cell he shared with Sharp. Hatton testified during a grand jury hearing for Hilford's criminal case in November. According to the lawsuit, Sharp, 21, had been moved into the cell about a month prior after Hilford had previously made the threat to hurt his next cellie. Hatton testified that Hilford had shouted to get Sharp out of the cell. Hatton looked into the cell and saw Sharp lying on the ground in a pool of blood. Before guards could handcuff Hilford, he stood over Sharp holding a 13-inch TV, motioning as if he was going to drop it on Sharp's head, an officer later testified. Part of the plastic around the TV had been torn off, with a sharpened tip about two inches long. Sharp had been stabbed with the sharpened piece of plastic in the head, chest, back, and arms. 
One of the ranking lieutenants testified that once officers led Hilford away from the cell, Sharp's eyes were lifeless and he couldn't find a pulse. So it sounds like this guy might have been dead in the cell for a while. Sharp was sentenced between 3 years, 8 months, and 11 years in prison. He was incarcerated for about 2 years at the Tonopah Conservation Camp where he worked for the Nevada Division of Forestry fighting wildfires. Four days before Sharp was killed, the Nevada Board of Parole Commissioners recommended that he be released from prison on March 31, 2021 when his minimum sentence was set to expire. Hilford was serving life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years for a 2006 murder. The shooting happened near the Vegas Strip when Hilford used a stolen shotgun to shoot and rob a man he saw walking by his car. On March 26, 2021, correctional officers say they witnessed inmates Jason Peters and Stephen Tonkinson stab fellow inmate William Dye on one of the prison's recreational exercise yards. The responding officers that witnessed the incident claim that they attempted to stop the stabbing with verbal commands. They say both Peters and Tonkinson were ordered to stop the assault and to lay flat on the ground, but neither one of them complied and continued to stab inmate Dye. When verbal commands failed to work, they then resorted to using pepper spray and other chemical agents to stop the assault. Dye was tended to by medical staff and he was later taken to the institution's infirmary, but despite the medical efforts that were taken, inmate Dye was pronounced dead shortly before noon. The one thing that stands out about all these stabbings is that they all seem to be the result of internal house cleaning and not the result of conflict amongst the different group segments. In other words, there's northerners killing northerners, whites killing whites, southerners killing southerners, and blacks killing blacks. That's what you call internal house cleaning. Obviously, no amount of violence is a good thing, but kudos to these guys for being able to maintain some level of harmony out there on these yards. Because trust me, if conflict did escalate or erupt out there, I don't think CDCR would be ready or equipped to deal with mass violence on that type of level. If a racial war or a war between Norteños and Sureños kicked off, it would be a bloodbath and on a magnitude that would be almost impossible to contain. The victim died with serving a 49 year sentence out of Butte County for attempted second degree murder and possession of a controlled substance. Peters was serving a 16 year sentence out of San Bernardino County for second degree robbery and other crimes. Tonkinson was serving 10 years out of Sacramento County for assault likely to commit great bodily injury. January 8, 2022, an inmate by the name of Benji Wade was found unresponsive in his cell by corrections officers who were performing a routine walk through the unit. Life-saving measures were implemented, however, Wade succumbed to his injuries and was pronounced deceased at 5.15 p.m. Wade was convicted out of Calusa County on August 11, 2021 to 13 years for second-degree robbery with use of a firearm. John Connell Wade Selly has been identified as the suspect. Connell was convicted out of Sacramento County on January 5th, 1989 to five years for robbery while armed with a firearm and battery with serious injury. He is currently serving life with the possibility of parole after being sentenced in 1998 in Sutter County on his third strike for escape from a county jail or prison without force. Although the Institution's Investigative Services Unit, ISU, didn't announce or confirm how Wade died, officers who initially found Wade's body believe he was killed from manual strangulation. I've seen a lot of dudes whack their cellies in prison, and in fact, I've even been in the same pod while one occurred. But the woods are notorious for killing their cellies, and it happens all the time. On February 18, 2022, staff members saw inmates Christopher Dolan and Michael Ellison attack 19-year-old Michael Hasty with inmate manufactured weapons in one of the prison's exercise yards. According to some of the incident reports, responding officers had to resort to using chemical agents and batons to break up the assault because Dolan and Ellison wouldn't comply with verbal commands. 
Although medical staff did everything they could to revive Hasty, he eventually succumbed to his injuries and died about an hour later. Two inmate stabby weapons were later recovered close to where inmates Dolan and Ellison were proned out and placed in mechanical restraints. The victim, Hasty, was sentenced out of Trinity County to life in prison with the possibility of parole for the January 2019 stabbing death of Nathan Perdue. Hasty was described as being in a jealous rage when he stabbed and killed Perdue. Dolan was serving a six-year sentence out of Ventura County for assault and resisting arrest. Ellison was sentenced out of Riverside County to life in prison with the possibility of parole for murder. According to prison reports, he was sentenced to additional time twice for making weapons and twice for assaulting fellow prisoners in 2005 and 2017. On July 25, 2022, two inmates were killed in separate incidents. Albert Martinez was killed at High Desert State Prison and Wayne Caskey was killed in Folsom State Prison. Both homicides were carried out in similar fashion and were almost identical. In each incident, the victims suffered fatal stabbing injuries and in both incidents, there were two attackers. But there were other similarities that were almost eerie when you put it in perspective. One of the victims was previously suspected in his cellmate's death and two of the four attackers were also suspected in prior slayings of other inmates. Martinez was seen being stabbed by correctional officers at High Desert State Prison on one of the prison's exercise yards by two inmates with stabbing instruments. Inmates Joseph Gama and Alvaro Saldana were identified as the attackers. Medical staff performed life-saving medical measures on Martinez, but he died 20 minutes later despite their efforts. The victim, Martinez, was originally sentenced for armed robbery out of Sacramento County, but while he was serving his time, he apparently picked up a life sentence under the three strikes law for battery on another prisoner. Gama was serving a 15-year sentence out of Stanislaus County for assault with a firearm. According to CDCR reports, Gama was also suspected in the slaying of another inmate at the same prison back in 2020. Saldana was serving a life term for first degree murder as a second striker and coincidentally, he was also convicted out of Stanislaus County. The other assault occurred at Folsom State Prison. Correctional officials say that they witnessed inmates Daryl Cole and Nicholas Mangeli attack fellow inmate Wayne Kasky with inmate manufactured weapons. The stabbing took place on one of the institution's maximum security exercise yards which required them to fire 40 millimeter less than lethal direct impact rounds to stop the assault. Medical staff attempted to transport Kasky to an outside hospital so that life-saving measures could be administered. However, he succumbed to his injuries 30 minutes later before he could be transported out. Kasky, the victim, was apparently suspected in the 2018 death of his cellmate. They say, what comes around goes around. And with all due respect to Kasky, maybe this was an unfortunate dose of bad karma. Kasky was serving a life sentence out of Sacramento County for first degree murder. While in prison, he received an additional four years for assault by a prisoner with a deadly weapon as a second striker. Cole was serving a life sentence out of San Diego County for first degree attempted murder, torture, assault, and battery. He has two additional four-year sentences for assault with a deadly weapon and possession of a deadly weapon as a second striker. Mangeli was serving a life sentence out of Sacramento County for first-degree murder. He also has an additional eight-year sentence for assault with a deadly weapon as an inmate. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. As always, we want to extend our gratitude and appreciation to you, the viewers, for continuing to support us and for just helping this channel become what it has. If you guys haven't seen the new series that we just started releasing, War and Destruction, War Stories, you might want to check it out. Inner Demons is a separate series and will continue to be put out. But for those of you who enjoy hearing about all the war stories that take place both in prison and on the streets, this one's definitely for you. Also, as I mentioned during my last live, I'm going to start doing the Q&A's and more of these short profiles 
So if you have any questions, drop them in the community section. For those of you who have been asking about the audiobooks or the books that I've been narrating, we just started a whole new lineup that should have already been released by the time this drops. We're trying to get away from being one dimensional and I've got a lot of ideas for the channel so we're going to be dropping an array of different types of content. If you guys have any ideas or any suggestions for improving the channel, by all means we encourage you to use your voices and help us become better. With that said, I just want to close by thanking you guys again for not only supporting us, but for also being patient and for bearing with us when we had our brief hiatus. We appreciate you guys, and you, the viewers, mean everything to us, because without you, we would cease to exist.